Welcome to another edition of Why Come Japan. I'm your host, Rad Reeve, where I interview creatives about their craft and how it relates to Japan. And today on my show is John Fagan. How are you today, John? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Um, real quick, uh, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but a person in the yeah. chat, one of my friends, East Coast The Most, asks, um, he says, who is this guy and does he own any crypto? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I wish I did. Bought it ages ago, but no, I don't. Yeah, to set you up a little bit here, Jay. Jay, uh, John is a, a writer. He He's written a book called Fishtown. It's a memoir where he talks about his experiences here in Japan. Um, I'd recommend it. It's a lot different. It's not like, uh, like I've read a couple of other books about, you know, foreigners coming to Japan, and a lot of it's kind of, it kind of brought me back in a way, because, you know, because I've been to Japan uh, or I've lived here for 11 years and, you know, it's those first couple of years or first couple of months that, like, really stick with you that, you know, that I don't even know how to describe them, really. And I, I think you did a pretty good job of describing what those first couple of weeks and months are like. It's mm. kind of chaotic. And you, you kind of, you somewhat, you love it and then you hate it at some points. Uh, it was very relatable. And you came to Japan as, like, an ALT at first, right? Yeah, yeah, so. Okay, you don't you don't say those words ALT. I think in the book, and I don't blame you for saying that because yeah, <laughs> you, you start to. What's that? Yeah, I, I didn't really know what an ALT was going to be. I thought like doing the interview and stuff, and all you've been in the schools and that, and um, I thought I'd be able to teach creative writing properly. Like I'd be in the oh, school. Oh boy! Oh no! 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I had that idea in my head, but some of the schools were loving that. That. Could, that was fine for them to do, but other ones, as you know, they're like, no, 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 this is not how things are done. Well, yeah, because their main focus is talking about, or, you know, featuring stuff about grammar, and, mm. and they teach English more like it's a science rather than it's, you know, a language that you explore and yeah, experiment with, whereas mm. I think some, a lot of the time with people here in Japan, they don't... Um, the reason why they don't really get better is because they don't, they're afraid to do something like that. And they're afraid to, you know, they're, they're worried that they're not perfect. Quote unquote. Yeah. They don't like to make mistakes and have been drilled into them. This is the answer. You know, I don't have the answer. That's not how it works for a language. Okay. So. Um, here's another question. Did you teach those kids to speak with a proper Scottish accent? Um, no, I was more like I had to put on an American accent a lot of the time. Um, it was a bad. No one really got a Scottish accent, which is a wee shame. That would have been good if I got a class speaking in a lovely Scottish accent and no one would be able to understand them. So, <laughs> yeah, but no. I remember you were saying in the book that a lot of people here in Japan, they understood your English. It was just Americans that never understood your English. Is that correct? Yeah, I found like Japanese people could because they're more used to tuning in an accent, but Americans, you're not used to tuning in because we'll. I find American accents easy because they're watching films and TV shows and stuff. But you wouldn't have seen anything from Scotland apart from mm -hmm. Sean Connery or Ewan McGregor or something. So it's just a bit of the year, but they're yeah, I found that definitely. As soon as I met an American person, it's always like what, what? Okay, huh. nearly everybody. Mm. Did did you ever find anybody here in Japan who appreciated that you were from Scotland, or they did just get disappointed that you weren't an American? <laughs> Not like uh, the second school I was at. They were okay. delighted. They were like, "Oh, something different. We can talk about other things apart from the the standard." Like ten years before, they had like checklist. Oh, where are you from? What's American like? What American food you like? It was something completely different. So they embraced it, whereas others, they were like, no, this is what you should be. If you're not this, pretend to be this. So, oh, okay. Can you do that? Did, did that ever get really annoying, or did you actually like it better? <laughs> it got annoying when I'd to, like, try and put on an American accent, which I'm terrible at, and, like, <laughs> communicate that way and, 
talk about American culture, which I'm not an expert on. So it'd be, it felt fake in a way, but then again, it would just be like, okay, I'm now this American character, off I go. So. Did, did you like watch any programs or any, anybody that you copied to like to get the accent down or you don't even think about it? The American accent's so hard, maybe. Like, uh, I was watching a lot. It's it always sunny in Philadelphia, so. Oh, I see. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I've seen so much American TV in that. Um, but I think even like a crap Scottish version of American sounds authentic to someone in a little rural town that's never heard anything before. So if that's what they want. Right, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, cause I, I kind of see that the, uh, what is it? The American accent, I, 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 you know, cause it's just the way I speak. I don't really think about mm. how difficult it is or if it is mm. difficult. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I can't imagine, I can't imagine like if I tried to do a Scottish accent, people would just be like, stop, just, just stop. <laughs> <laughs> like you're, you're, you're making yourself look really bad. You know, <laughs> I'd never, I wouldn't yeah. even try. I mean, I'm, I imagine that's kind of how you felt. Yeah, that's it. That was the start. I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is going to sound terrible, but... Did anybody that. believe yeah. you? I mean, well, I guess in Japan, people would believe you, but... Well, yeah, they they know I'm not from America. I just, like, put on an accent that they can somewhat... that they're used to from their CD players and all that stuff. And right. um, the, the way their teacher is pronouncing everything, then that's what they wanted. So, well... Some of them did, some didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you're saying there, like, the Scottish accent is, to me, a normal accent. This is right. what, this is the usual, anything different for this is a foreign accent to me. Right, so, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, uh, I kind of want to pivot here a little bit with the questions. Um, mm-hmm. Now, you've written a lot of short stories like this one before. What would you say inspired you to write a full mm-hmm. story? Um, something that's got legs. I think if I start, some of my books that I've wrote, um, that I've not sent for publishing yet, started off as short stories, but then when you get to the end, you feel like there's so much more to say, or the character lives in your head a bit more, and you just want to expand it. So mm-hmm. I don't, I don't plan like the length or um, the structure or the ending. I just write it out. And then see where it goes. I think that's the best advice for writing that I've taken. Like, follow your characters. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, one line from the book that I kind of made the title of this. Actually, the, this is a, probably my favorite line from the entire book. Maybe you don't remember writing it. I hope you remember. I'm sure you remember every single word you wrote in the entire book, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the one one quote I really liked was uh, foreign wounds don't heal in places like Japan did you ever feel that you had some of your own foreign wound, wounds while living here in, or were living in Fishtown or living in Japan in general yeah I think I think everybody gets them like uh, wounds that you take from your own place that you think I'm going to fix my life and it's going to be amazing in Japan and uh it doesn't work that way. It's not like a, a plaster or a band-aid. Japan doesn't work that way. And you're going to get new things that are going to mess you up in Japan that you have to sort. So did I get them? Definitely. Mm-hmm. As you can see. So, But I don't think anybody comes unscathed apart from your one-week holiday where you go to Disneyland or Yasu. And that's right. It, you know what I mean? So, right. So I, remember, I recall from the book that what you were, when, in the very beginning, you, you were trying to get a job down in London, mm-hmm. and things weren't working out so well, but then you saw an advertisement for, you know, working here in Japan, and you were promised Tokyo and everything. Mm-hmm. Where did you find this advertisement? Do you remember? Um, I think it was just looking up um, TEFL jobs. Oh, okay. It was, up, it was like... So it was like Japan, Korea, China, all the places. And I was like, focus on Japan. I applied. I just went for there and got the job. 
Yeah, and they like, and they like that you had TEFL experience because I've been like many jobs here in Japan, and like it seems like <laughs> a lot of these these things they expect from you, you never use them. Yeah, no, like that was the part you had to send in your TEFL certificate and stuff, um, as well as your degrees. You needed a degree and a TESOL, mm -hmm. TEFL, something like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah, was it what I expected? Thinking back in Scotland, I'm going to Japan. No, but that's, I think I, I, yeah. Sorry, you go. No, go ahead. And I think that's um, that's not a bad thing in a way for getting the most out of your experience. If you know everything that's going to happen, you're expecting everything. Then it's a completely different life you're going to have. So. Uh, so so what kind of expectations did you have before coming to Japan? Um, I thought it would be very futuristic. Um, I thought, <laughs> I know. We're going to Yaizu, probably not. But <laughs> oh, God, no. Um, and uh, I thought there'd be lots of technology, ease of the schools. Um, it'd be at least PowerPoints to teach in. And uh, yeah, I thought there'd be a lot more technology. That was my main thing I was really surprised about. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to the first place, and it was a squat toilet as well. We know hot water and a blackboard and I was like coming because when I went to Osaka and I stayed in a fancy hotel and I think they made it to be like a sort of futuristic space thing and that just like imprinted on me like this is exactly what I thought it was going to be and then coming from Osaka ended up in the eyes it was like oh no this is what I have to live <laughs> so yeah I think that and um the level of English as well, I presumed it'd be a lot higher, um, but there was, even high schools and universities as well, it's very low. And as um, mentioned before, like people are afraid to make mistakes and afraid to um, do anything that's not perfect in English, so they just close up and they don't really express themselves and they don't speak. So. Communication is a bit more difficult than I thought. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's basically non-existent. I mean, English. Yeah. It, it's because yeah. I think it's only like middle school when they first start to learn English as like a, a language. It's not how yeah. how it is like in Korea where they learn, you know, from elementary school. Yeah, it it sounds from the book that it was pretty quite tumultuous for you here. Mm. Um, that. You get there and you were promised Tokyo, but you weren't given Tokyo. And then you were given a car and then you kept parking in the wrong parking spot. And then they kept getting upset about that. And then you had one teacher who was, he was just a pain in the ass to deal with, where he always, he, he was disappointed that you weren't American. And he always wanted you to yeah. teach like some, uh, some bullshit grammar technique or something, or something from a book that was like from, 20 years mm -hmm. ago or probably yeah. even more than that when you first like saw all this and you realized you had to adapt and change to this life did you ever have that feeling of all right i'm going home right now <laughs> yeah like, yeah <laughs> there was more than a few times they just like, after work you'd sit in and you'd go what am i doing yeah it's like how you're getting treated and stuff and just like this is not what i signed up for and uh and there's no one really, and you've got friends and stuff like that, but there's no one really that you can talk to at the school or at your company and that, because they are, they're not really on your side. They're getting so many people coming through. So they are, focus is on keeping the Board of Education happy and the schools happy. It doesn't really matter who they send in. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you feel isolated that way and definitely... I felt more than a few times just like the weekend, like, you know what, that's it. I'm dreading going back in on Monday and finding out what's in store. So, but I think you have to digest that a wee bit more and say, right, especially my situation coming, there wasn't any work where I was in Scotland. So it was like, what did I do? Would, Run back. Would you say that was the primary motivator for keeping you staying in Japan at that time? It was one of them. I think uh, that definitely. And... I'm not just going to be 
going away in someone else's terms. Like I wanted to make it work in Japan. I wasn't just going to give up and coming across the first person that didn't like me essentially and didn't like where I was from and have I done things. So like I'm not, he's not going to decide what my life's going to be. So it was a bit like that, you know. Right, right. I understand. Um, but yeah, you stayed in Japan for quite some time, making it all the way to like a university job over at Meikai University. Um, yeah. how, how many years was that? I think I lost track of the time. So three years in Meikai University. Three years. Before. Okay. Yeah. And then I guess two years at Yaizu, and then there was some in between as well? Yeah, there was two in Yaizu and then in Shisui. Oh, that's right. Which I'd done high school and special needs and I was in Tokyo and then working with these schools and then Meikai. Sounds like a little under 10 years, I guess I could say. Yeah, it was just about seven years. Okay. And the the primary thing that probably got you to leave Japan was, or at least what I gathered from the book, was you were with your your girlfriend, who happens to also be the same name as my girlfriend. <laughs> I mean, of course, we talked, you know, before we went live that you, you changed the names of yeah. the, the, the people. Oh, did you change the names of everybody in the book? Or was just there's some that have the same name? There's some that have got the same name. Um, I think it's about 70, the same name, 30%. I had to change. Like, I contacted a few people saying, do you mind me putting this wee story in? And if... They were like, yeah, but you can you change my name, then that's fine. I see. Yeah. So can I can I say because the because the book is kind of about your life, and I mean, I it, I I saw that you said in other interviews that it it kind of makes you really self conscious, you know, that you're putting your life out there. It's like putting yourself as a character in a book to where like more people know like this this information about you. Um, do you, does this make you feel particularly uncomfortable, like talking about these kind of private moments that you've had here in Japan? Not really. I, Not I think, really. Uh, no, it's past. I think thinking about it is more like anxious than, makes me more anxious than actually doing it now. Like thinking okay. before, like, oh, I'm going to share this now. It's like, it's out there now. It's, it's. That is my story, but it's now something that belongs to everybody who reads it now. So. Right. Well, because the reason I, wanna, I wanted to ask, because in the book, um, you have your girlfriend, uh, Kiki, for a long time, and then she has this real abrupt breakup with you, and suddenly it just like it just completely changed your life, and it de derailed everything. Would you say mm -hmm. that was the primary reason? I mean, besides, like, you also mentioned that, you know, a lot of your parents, you know, they're, they're getting old. I mean, I, I've experienced this as well. And then you had a lot of things that were just kind of going south. Because, I mean, you, it sounded like you had, like, the university. Because in terms of English teaching, everybody wants a yeah. university job. That's, like, the top tier university mm. jobs. Um, but I, I'm guessing this was the primary reason was because of the, was the girlfriend and because of the, you know, seeing your parents get older. Can I say that? Yeah, um, I think, well, teaching-wise, my career-wise, I really loved it at Meikai. It was a, it was a great job. Um, people I was working with were amazing, and the holidays you get as well made me able to go travelling and stuff. So work-wise, it wasn't a problem. Um, yeah, I think when that relationship came to an end, and um, when people come to visit and you see how much they've changed, and you're thinking, I'm missing out in people's lives back home. Um, why am I here? So it makes me think again, yeah, why am I here? And um, do I want to get in a relationship in Japan and start again here? Or do I want to go back home? And uh, I never planned to be in Japan. I don't think anyone really does though, do they? But I never planned to be in Japan forever. Mm -hmm. So it was coming up, it was coming up in like the gaijin one more year thing, you know, oh, one more year, one more year, one more year. I think I just, I maxed out. I went, okay, I think that's, this is a good time to go back home. And maybe I may want to go back to Japan. I thought that there's, there's a chance that I won't be able to sell 
Um, so it wasn't like uh, I was making a 100% commitment. I was done. I just thought I need to do something different. I need a change. Mm-hmm. And going back home seemed like a good thing. So if you talk to a lot of foreigners here in Japan, you often find that they kind of go through the same process. Would you recommend others? Because I, I talk to a lot of other foreigners here in Japan that they always recommend that people should go home. Would you recommend that they always go home? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if you don't go home, I see some people that have left and then a year later, like, oh, I'm back. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> um, that happens. Um, but if you're really feeling like that, like weight on your back that you want to go home and see, then you should go home and see. Um, otherwise, you're going to turn around and be 50 years old and that. It's too late to start again doing anything. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. Especially if you're younger. It's not like Japan's a prison and as soon as you leave, you can't get back in. Well, maybe now, because that's the same, but it's more difficult, but yeah. Don't stay yeah. about being miserable. Yeah. I think that's very true um, because I did meet a few other foreigners here in Japan where they went back home and then they came back and they're still here. Um, they don't really know if it's just nostalgia or if it's just because their life was better here. Um, mm. But it, it seemed like your your life improved a lot over the years after, you know, being an ALT in Fishtown. Yeah, uh, I mean, to be honest about my feelings about the book... Um, I could tell that it, it kind of had a very, uh, I guess you would, you would say despondent kind of tone to it at the very beginning. And then, um, I was feeling so bad for you. I was feeling really, really bad. And, you know, then you had even worse situations. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> is this gonna, cause like, I don't know, you meet some foreigners in Japan where they're just, they're just a cloud of negativity. Right. They're always talking about, you know, negative, you know, things that they they can't fix here in Japan and they don't do much to improve their situation. Mm. Like they never make it to the, the stage like where you're at, where they've made it back home and they, they had an experience. Um, so w- would you say that, you know, because you went through this, um, would you say that you had more of a positive experience? rather than a negative one? I think, I know the book is very negative, but I wanted it to be real. Um, right, no, it definitely wasn't, wasn't real. I didn't want to, um, I wasn't a negative person, definitely in Japan, I was always very, in a positive outlook. So maybe, I think some people reading it, that I knew in Japan reading it going, wow, I didn't know this about you. I didn't think you were like that. So, uh, because I think that's drinking as well. You go, you're just drunk and you're happy. And, I think that masks a lot of things as well. Mm-hmm. Um, especially in Japan, it's that's the lifestyle of a foreigner, really. When you're younger and you're first getting there and you move to Tokyo, it's just like, what am I going to do? Get drunk every possible mm-hmm. opportunity. So, um, yeah, but I think overall, looking back, it was definitely a positive experience, but it wasn't unmarked by negativity. Big things that happened, but... Um, Makes for a good story, for yeah. a good life. I, for a good life, I don't know. Um, but I'm happy how it turned out, to be honest. Yeah, we no, uh, so. there were some very memorable moments. Um, a couple of things that were quite funny. Um, a couple of moments that, you know, that were sad. And a kind of good mix of emotions. But it, it seemed like you could see that your uh, life was getting more interesting as the longer you lived here and you kind of got used to the swing of things, the way things mm. work here in the, in Japan. Um, because uh, I forgot which Shakespeare novel it is or play. I can't remember which one it was. But, like, usually when it comes to, like, structuring a book or structuring a, I guess, a play as well, it usually always starts off with, you know, um, I guess maybe for an example, like Romeo and Juliet, uh, it ends in like a tragedy. You could also do something where it's it's positive beginning, positive middle, and positive ending. And then you have some books that are like positive, 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 and negative, negative, negative. So hmm. I, I was, uh, did you ever think in these terms 
of like Tron when you when you put together the book, or it just um, kind of just came out the way you just said, well, this is what I remember, and this is how you know, this is the story I want to tell. Yeah, I think uh, it's Kurt Vonnegut that does the shape of stories. So right, like, right. You've got your standard ones, and I think Hamlet. You might be talking about it. That's like the perfect story shouldn't be like you can map it out, starts somewhere, something good happens, something bad happens, something better happens. A, a good story should be, you don't know where to put it. Like, well, it could be, it's up and down, up and down, there's not really some definitive shape to it. But for this, because it's non-fiction, I wasn't really planning it in a way of, or thinking about how is this going to be. It just came as it was. But um, there was quite a lot of things that I had to change and cut out for the the first draft because it was twice the size and I would meander. So I think maybe it was in the back of my head like I have to have some sort of coherent story that's not drifting away that's going to bore the reader. Mm -hmm. Just like little more cultural things about Japan or more things about life teaching at university and that's like not everyone's going to be interested in that and it just takes away from the, the pace. So, yeah, I think at the back of my mind, maybe. Hmm. Uh, have you ever seen any other books that have been written in this style, the, the poetic style? I want to call it that if you don't mind me calling it that. I haven't, no. Like, no, okay. I wasn't trying to be original. I just, like, that's how I looked at my phone and I took out the capital letters and stuff because it just made it look a bit better. And... Cormac McCarthy gets read a lot of punctuation and I read a lot of his stuff. Mm. And I thought, it doesn't really need it because I was writing, I wasn't putting in punctuation. Then I was going back one day, I need to put commas in full stops that year. And I thought, I'll just see how it looks without it. And it, it read fine. And I think once you tune into the style, then it's not going to be a problem. So I thought, yeah. You said you wrote this book on your phone. Like how much yeah. editing went into like the final draft? It was quite a lot in terms of uh, making it a good format, making a good fit, because most of it was just like a note, like this is what happened, da, 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 to put into something that read a bit better. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them were just as they were. A lot of the chapters were just exactly as I threw it out. Um, but some I changed, some I made once it started to get in and started to focus it a bit more. And I cut a lot of them down as well. Some were really long. And to fit with the rest of the style then, put them down that way. Okay. Um, so I guess we're kind of near the, the end of the show here. So I can talk a little bit about um, spoilers. But I mean, what, what, what's your opinion on spoilers? Do you hate that kind of stuff? Do you hate, do you hate people who spoil TV shows or episodes or whatever? Can't stand it. I don't even read the blurbs in the back of a book in case it spoils it for me. I don't ever watch trailers or anything. If right. No, I understand. Good. I understand. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to, because, you know, when, when you get like a creator or a writer on, I always like being able to talk about, you know, the art itself. And sometimes <laughs> like when, you know, you're talking about art and especially when, like when it's a movie or it's a book, uh, or some piece that has like a, a beginning and, and like an end that you have to, you know, read or consume um, in a fashion that starts from past to future. It's, I always like di dissecting and talking about everything. So the ending of the book kind of goes on and it talks about how you get on the airplane and then you just say, and now my life is over. Uh, more, or le more or less words. Is that correct? Did I get that right? Nice. No, it's more about my life as I knew it. Oh, my life as, as I knew it was over. That's correct. All right. You, please correct me if I get anything wrong. Um, yeah, when, when I read that and then I cut to the, I, you know, I scrolled down to the next page, I saw a photo of you. I'm like, wait, that's <laughs> it? <laughs> it was very much like, imagine you're listening to a song and then, you know, whoa, whoa. Like it was kind of like whiplash in a way. Like I didn't even know that was going to be the very ending of it. Like I said, well, where, where's more? You know, <laughs> like is there a part two to this? Is there a Fishtown part two? <laughs> Am I missing it? Um, I think I, I think that's uh, it's always good to leave your reader wanting more. 
Oh, of course, of course. That, yeah, I think that's a good a natural end to where the story goes. So, right. So, do you have do you have any plans of writing a book about your life now in Scotland? You're in Edinburgh, right? Right now? Yeah, I'm in Edinburgh. Yeah. Edinburgh. Um, Correct my pronunciation, please. Uh, no, not really. Um, I think that's a good memoir to have. If I'm, maybe I'll write something in the future. Um, but I think right now, I don't know. I'm just back. It would be a pandemic book, and I don't think anybody <laughs> yeah, wants right? to read. Yeah. Well, w- what's interesting is you made it back to. A- Japan made it back to the Scotland like right when the pandemic started, right? Yeah. So I went traveling after. You I picked left. the best time to travel. <laughs> I was chased. I was getting chased by it. So it's really, <laughs> well, it's not uh, like we planned any of this, but yeah. Yeah, it's true. So I get back and it's it's not been it's been completely different to where I thought it would be. Got my flat here. And um a couple of weeks later, lockdown starting to happen and Everything's closed, so I was lucky to get the place and stuff. But it's um, it's a bit more isolating than I thought it would be. Like coming back and meeting everybody and it'd be great. It's a wee bit, a wee bit different, but it's all opening up now. So, oh, that's good. Are the numbers a lot better now? I'm guessing you have the vaccine there now, right? Yeah, most people have been getting the vaccine now. They're going to like under thirties, I think. So I've not had it yet, but. Oh, okay. Most most people in my family have had it now, so. What is it? Here in Japan, like, less than 1% of the population has it. So, <laughs> and plus they want the Olympics here. So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's Japan, you know. It doesn't surprise me. Yeah. It doesn't surprise you? <laughs> no. <laughs> because everything was so mismanaged when you first came to Japan? Is that why, not surpri- is that why it doesn't surprise you? No, I think they would have... This is the way we'll do it. So something completely new like this to react to. Mm-hmm. I think they'd, be, they'd have to have too many meetings about it. They love a good meeting. So yeah, no, I, I know what that's like. Mm. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you that's not really in your book. I guess it's kind of in your book. Um, but you're. I forgot exactly the comparison you made. It was an. It was an analogy, where you said something like, uh, "They sold more than you know." Ice, they sold more than they do ice cream in Scotland in July. Is that okay, like, yeah. do they really eat a lot of ice cream in Scotland? Oh, yeah. Like, uh, especially in the winter. It's just a normal thing to be ice really? cream everywhere. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, why is that? I don't, I have no idea why. Because I saw a movie once based up in Scotland. It was Comfort and Joy. I'm sure you're familiar with it. I don't know that one. You don't actually. know that one? Okay, I'm surprised. I don't know. Uh, I guess it was like supposedly like there was these two crime families that were against each other in Scotland and they both operated out of ice cream trucks. Oh, it's the ice cream wars? Yeah, the ice cream wars. Yeah, it was a movie about the ice cream wars. Yeah. Maybe there's a different uh, title in Scotland. I don't know. Maybe. I I know of the real story, but I didn't know they made it in a film. I I I like that that movie. Yeah, that was a good one. Is that about them selling drugs and ice cream? Yeah, it's about them selling drugs and how they had, like, turf wars. I don't exactly remember everything from the film, but I remember enjoying it. I guess that's that's all that matters at the end of the day. Mm. Um, I think, do we like ice cream and cold things here? Because it's always cold, really. Um, We've got a decent summer, so ice cream's nice. You wrap up, eat it. Fine. Do they have any ice cream flavors that they don't have in other parts of the world that they only have there? No, I think the main one here is <laughs> vanilla or raspberry ripple. Okay, like raspberry ripple. Okay, all right. Mm. No, what, like what do they have here in Japan? Like popping shower and <laughs> all those other weird ones. Yeah, yeah, that's something as well. Like I like trying new things. I like trying new drinks, and so Japan was great for that. You could go and your Seven Eleven. They've got ten new things. You're like, oh, what is this? Cigarette flavored Kit Kat. Cigarette flavored. Oh, that's what oh, that, that, that had, uh, what was that? The soy sauce Kit Kats. I've seen that. Oh, yeah, what? that is a thing. 
Mm. Well, it's like if you say cigarette Kit Kats, that's that's definitely something I've never seen. It'd be surprised no. if they ever did me. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if one cigarette gets banned there. They're like to the salary men. Why do you get your taste to your? <laughs> <laughs> Let me go for it. Yeah, I could see that too. That's true. Mm. I, I remember seeing some really weird flavors. These weren't in Japan, but like ones in the U.S. called like chicken and waffle flavor. Like mm. what? <laughs> anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> all right, then. Uh, that about wraps up all my questions for the interview. Is there anything you'd like to say before we go? Um, I'll do a wee promo. So. Fish Town is about a Scottish man jumping over to Japan. If you live in Japan, you probably relate to it. Um, if you're not, if something that you want to be interested about a travel story, then buy it. You can get it from Guts Publishing, or you can get it from Waterstones, Amazon, basically everybody. So Google the book and see what the best price is and go for it. <laughs> so, so, so you rec you recommend uh, Amazon? Is that correct? Amazon's one of them, but their prices are a bit crazy with us. The oh, Guts is they put it at nine ninety five or thirteen dollars for the American or Amazon Japan's fine. Okay, they've got normal price, but Amazon in the UK they started to charge it double price. That's oh, what's, what's going on here? Okay. Uh, we can't we can't control the prices, so um, fine. I'm not going to say anything bad about Amazon because right, no, 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 no. It's fine. Control, I mean, they're, they're, they they control they, everything. Do they? I don't know. I mean, they're they're so huge. It's just it's like me saying something bad about Disney. You know, everybody's heard it before. <laughs> like, yeah. what's the worst thing you could possibly say? Like, what could they do to you? They're not Scientology or something. <laughs> you know, they're not oh, going to get on your case <laughs> if like you say something negative about them. But, um, but yeah, in, in all seriousness, uh, this book's a fun read, you know, if, especially if you want to read a memoir about living in Japan or you want to reflect about your time living in Japan or what it's like, or just have kind of a like this little flashback, something that's, uh, it's, it's artsy and it's also kind of, uh, um, what other adjectives could I use to describe it? Um. Yeah, artsy is definitely one of them, and it's very, I guess the word you'd say is laid back. Not sure what, what what adjectives would you use? I mean, I, I, this is always the hardest thing. It's like when somebody picks, when your teacher picks on you at school, and they're like, all right, say three great things about yourself. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know, maybe it's kind of raw. It's raw, like, okay, there we go. It could be artsy, but it's not polished to like, as like jumping from someone's thoughts and a story, so it is more relatable rather than making it all beautiful and flowing nicely and that way. Yeah, so the links will be down in the description if you'd like to buy the book, um, whether it's hard copy or digital. So until then, I'm Radri and, and I'm John. And uh, yeah. hey, John. Yeah. Jesus, man. Did you enjoy?